Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. In American politics, scandals have always been a favorite spectator sport. But today, some people think the rules of the game have changed. Have they? And if so, so what? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are Larry Sabato, professor of government at the University of Virginia and co-author of Dirty Little Secrets, The Persistence of Corruption in American Politics. Suzanne Garment, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and author of Scandal, The Culture of Mistrust in American Politics. Elizabeth Drew, author of Showdown, The Struggle Between the Gingrich Congress and the Clinton White House. And Gil Troy, professor of history at McGill University in Montreal and author of the forthcoming book, Affairs of State, The Rise and Rejection of the Presidential Couple. The topic before this house, how should we handle scandal? This week on Think Tank. America loves a good scandal. American politicians aim to please. In the 1920s, the Harding administration was tarnished by charges of bribery in the Teapot Dome scandal. In 1884, after it was revealed that Democratic nominee Grover Cleveland had fathered an illegitimate child, Republicans chanted, Ma, 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 where's my pa? Gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. And Grover Cleveland was elected. Of course, in 1974, President Richard Nixon Seriously. resigned because of the scandal, which became known and as Watergate. Since Watergate, major scandals and firestorms have exploded at an apparently escalating rate, driven by Chairman congressional Hatch. hearings, newly created independent councils, investigative reporters, and public interest groups, all in business to expose wrongdoing, a view that has been advanced by our panelist, Suzanne Garment. Recent allegations and revelations about President and Mrs. Clinton have sent the scandal industry into overdrive, raising some important questions, including, to what extent are these scandals media-created and media-driven? When is a scandal important and when is it trivial? And have Americans accepted scandal? After all, a recent poll showed 56% of Americans believe President Clinton intentionally abused power by obtaining FBI files, but the same poll also found that 56% of the public approve of the job President Clinton is doing. And lastly, how should American voters handle scandal? Larry Sabato, has the playing field in the School for Scandal changed in recent years? I think it's changed enormously at least in the recent decades. It used to be that the media refused to air or print rumor without a substantial body of proof or evidence. Now rumor is aired and printed with abandon. Okay, Elizabeth Drew. I agree, Ben. I think the bar has been lowered uh, against what gets into print and even goes out on the air. I think probably a real low was hit over the Gary Aldrich book. And I think a lot of news organizations... The Gary Aldrich book, tell us what oh, that one the, was about. The man who's always described as a former FBI agent, I mean, he was one, uh, who was in the, uh, assigned to the Bush and then the Clinton White House, who published a book uh, that had a number of, as he had to admit, unsubstantiated rumors in it, and a certain amount of that, in fact, a great deal of that, got into the, quote, legitimate, unquote, press, as well as on television. And I think a number of news organizations are going through little sessions of self-criticism now and those that aren't should. Okay. Uh, Gil Troy. 19th century press was filled with rumors. It was filled with bile. It was filled with scandal. I think what's changed, though, is the context in which we view it. We tend to respect the press more. We tend to believe them more. And we also don't have other experiences with politics. We don't vote as much. We don't march as much. We don't have party identity. And so we don't have mediating influences to dilute the scandal. Okay. Suzanne Garment. It has changed. Every generation sets its own rules for scandal. Uh, we have lowered the bar uh, in modern times. Uh, and uh, we're in the process now of deciding whether we want to raise it again. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, you have also written that the, the structure of scandal generation has changed, that we have institutionalized what, in the, why don't you just explain that it, to us? It's true that today there are many more institutions uh, with the capacity to uncover alleged wrongdoing, publicize it, punish it, uh, so that you have more sources of possible scandal news. Uh, what we can do about it, though, if we don't like the results, uh, is to change the way we view the information that these institutions produce. Uh, the press is the, is the first place where those decisions get made. Elizabeth, the, the point was made on this Gary Aldrich book that uh, true blue reporters, probably even you, use anonymous sources. Why was it so terrible for Gary Aldrich to use anonymous Because of sources? what he purveyed. And as he said, really without many sources at all. I mean, in the end, the, the most uh, squalid thing he purveyed, I don't want to repeat on the air, I'm not going to be part of his transmission belt. He had to admit, uh, he finally said, oh, that was some speculation that needs to be pursued. I mean, that's no standard at all. If Gary Aldrich walked into a respectable newsroom, if he had, and said, look, you know, I've got it that this President Clinton did this and this and this happened, and they'd say, well, because he has no credentials as a journalist, and I think you have to make some distinctions Well, here. you say he has no credentials. He spent allegedly 30 years as an FBI he investigator. No now, he, he would say that's as good credentials as Bob Woodward said, has or Elizabeth Drew. I don't think so. I mean, I'm not as, I'm not as qualified to be an FBI agent. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, in any event, he, I said he didn't have good credentials as a journalist. or. Even, even if somebody came into one of those papers that was their own person who had something that was really so unusual, took the whole subject way beyond where it had been, he'd be questioned by his editors. I, I think Elizabeth Drew makes the right distinction as far as the Gary Aldrich book is concerned. You can divide that book into two main pieces. One is credible, and that is relying on his experience as an FBI agent over 30 years and I believe five years in the White House when he talks about the uh, difficulty in getting the Clinton people to go through security clearance uh, to get their proper clearance to view classified information. Those charges are serious and I believe him because he has the background to make those sorts of distinctions. But the other part of the book is absolute trash. It regards uh, rumor as being fact, as Elizabeth has noted. Uh, he relies uh, on uh, just a source, a single source, for the most outlandish and scurrilous uh, part of the book. If you have not been questioned on the validity of what you do, if you've built up a reputation over the years, people trust you. And if you've shown yourself unworthy of trust, they don't. You know, the, it's the, a character question. The, the we book will also, return to character. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry, no, the book raises another question as well, apart, even apart from veracity. There are some things that, that he saw with his own eyes. Um, we should probably assume that they're true. Uh, and yet uh, they raise the question of whether they're important enough to be reported uh, or reported as evidence of moral turpitude, which is what, which is what he's doing. Um, what, what, what do you think? I mean, he says that he, he, he knows firsthand that the Clinton original White House staff sought to avoid uh, FBI investigations. That's pretty important. What may not be so important is all his observations about the dress habits of various Clinton staffers uh, or uh, what kind of Christmas ornaments Mrs. Clinton mm -hmm. decided to put on the White House Christmas tree. If she did. If, that's right. I, I, for sake of argument, assume, <laughs> assume she did. Um, there's still the question of whether it's evidence of anything morally significant. But I actually think that's the heart of the book. What's really going on is a culture clash between an older culture uh, that this FBI agent represents, a rock-ribbed Republican culture, and a counterculture, the McGovernics, as uh, Newt Gingrich called them. And that's what really kind of makes the scandal interesting, and, it, and that's what makes it significant. It, it makes it 
both interesting and significant. Whether it's morally significant is, a, is another question. It, it's <laughs> trivial, though, Gil. Yes. I mean, that, that kind of information, while I agree with you, it can be fascinating at one level, it's trivial, and it doesn't really feed into the basic decision that Americans are going to have to make in November. I have a little problem uh, with lumping all the th aforementioned things into scandals. They are of such different scale and of such different importance. I mean, I will resist till my last breath using the suffix gate <laughs> on anything other than Watergate, which was the real name of the place where the little burglary occurred that started the whole thing. Watergate was a constitutional struggle. It was very, very high stakes over very important things like the Fourth Amendment. And I don't think we can throw, and I wouldn't even call it a scandal in a way. It was, it was bigger than that. The Fourth Amendment is uh, search and seizure. Search and seizure, and here are these people hired by people connected to the White House going in and raiding somebody's psychiatrist's file. That's about as scary as it can get. But scandal mm -hmm. is one of those words that are circular. Uh, that is, scandal is what scandalizes us. And um, you, you've pointed to the, the difference between the constitutional struggle and the Christmas tree ornaments. And I think it's that lack of discrimination that probably marks us the most of all. The populace, millions of people are fascinated by this. Why are they fascinated by this? Because they impute a certain kind of significance to these issues. And I don't think it's just trivial. I think that people, you know, in 1996, there's going to be a generational clash going on between Bob Dole and Bill Clinton. And both of them are going to try to trigger all kinds of associations saying, what do I stand for? Who am I? And it gets to the kind of the fundamental questions of democracy. Who do we want as a leader? And where do, where do we want to go? Well, and it also gets to one of the crucial issues of our time, which is since the 1960s, our consensus culture has been, has been splintered. We're not quite sure where to go. We're not quite sure what we believe. And we're trying to recreate some common values. And the unfortunate thing is that we have to do it in a world where the media is so central. Well, well, Gil, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go no, ahead, Susan. Yeah, well, sure. no, uh, Gil, what you're, what you're saying is true in the sense that you're talking about the character issue, and it is important to focus on the, on the character issue, I agree. But look, the, the distinction that, that I'm trying to draw here, and I think some others are trying to draw, is that the media ought to focus on aspects of character for which there's a substantial body of proof or evidence that false allegations have no business being given airtime or being given print space or in newspapers or unsubstantiated uh, rumors and allegations. But, uh, uh, Journalists have always been scavengers on a certain level, with all due respect. And um, I think the difference is the way As we view it. As opposed to academics, Professor Troy, oh, right? We're, we're just <laughs> pompous. <laughs> 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 you're, you're pompous. We have, we have, right. we have different character flaws. Right. Uh, but what, what, I, what I'm interested in is why is it that voters so focus on the media? And I think it's because you know, we don't interact with each other in communities anymore. We don't interact with each other even over the radio talking about what's going on. We sit and we experience things through television, through newspaper. And so there aren't these other mediating influences. There aren't these other things to dilute our experience with the media and with scandal. And so as a result, we spend far too much time focusing on journalists. We spend far too much money paying them to lecture. And we spend careful, far too much. Careful, <laughs> right. right. And, and, and we end up respecting them when we've made them the centers, the stars of our political arena. And as a result, our political arena is suffering. It's true that, that as other institutions have declined, the press for some people becomes the only bulletin board in town. So any flaws that are there are magnified in their effects. And, and journalists have this mantle of objectivity. I mean, in the old days of the partisan press, if I was a Republican, I believed what I read in the Republican paper. And what I learned was that Democrats were scandals. But I also learned that uh, the Republicans were heroes. And we also we have kind of lost heroes in our world. We don't have people kind of building them up. I think if you look at the polls, though, the approval polls, journalists are way down there with politicians and sometimes confused for the same thing, to be the same thing. Down, I don't down think with it's, used car sales. It's just plain there. Uh, I think we're getting a little stray. If you could look at how many people read newspapers, even. Um, so I'm not sure that it's journal journalists as but stars may raise some problems, Elizabeth, but I don't it, think it, that one. It is, uh, is the character issue on whatever politician, not necessarily mm -hmm. President Clinton. I, I, is that a legitimate issue or should voters say it's content stupid and I agree with Clinton, maybe he's a scoundrel, maybe he's not, but I like him. Or should they say uh, any candidate, not President Clinton, he is morally flawed and as Gil says, morally flawed in a certain way coming out of this counterculture, whatever it is, and therefore character is destiny. 
and content. I wouldn't begin to tell the voters how important this should be to them, nor would I suggest that uh, character is something that you can only uh, decide on based on these, quote, scandals. Character is also how you deal with issues. It's a, and it's a very subjective thing, and voters are going to decide. I, you know, I don't like that guy because, and he may be saying something, or she may be saying something that doesn't have to do with scandals. Maybe they think somebody is too slick, for to take a wild example, or to <laughs> take another one. Maybe they think somebody is sort of too out of it and not, you know, not up to date. There's a whole amalgam of things that I think make up character well beyond and, and, anything. And these are very legitimate concerns for, for a are. voter, picking, that they don't yeah. just vote on how they stand on welfare or how well, they stand but on ben, foreign policy. Well, what I'm saying is you can also say how they stand on welfare can even be, in some people's minds, a character issue. It's a combination. I think for, for most voters, it's a combination of their judgment about the candidate's character and their uh, agreement or disagreement with the candidate's positions on key issues. I mean, most people weigh all of these matters in making up their mind, and that's perfectly legitimate. In Bill Clinton's case, uh, my, my point to the Clinton critics, the people who are spreading many of these scurrilous rumors is, look, there's plenty already on the record about Bill Clinton, both positive and negative in the character arena. I, I go back to what the great political scientist V.O. Key said. He said voters are not fools, and they really aren't. They take all of this information and they weigh it and they balance it, and in the end they reach a responsible judgment in most cases. One of the great ironies of the Clinton administration is that in 1992 he tried to make the election a referendum on issues. And he said, it's the economy, stupid, let's not focus on issues, let's, let's not focus on character, let's not gossip. And I think in the last three, four years, what we've seen is a resurgence of the character issue because he, in his presidency, has somehow linked the character flaws with some of the policy flaws. Uh, Joe Klein in Newsweek wrote this great piece on the politics of promiscuity, how Bill Clinton's need, his desire, his compulsive push constantly to seduce people both one-on-one -on -one and also po and, and, and fellow leaders has led to a certain kind of sloppiness in foreign policy, a certain sloppiness in domestic policy. And that is a, a point where you can't quite distinguish between character and policy. So I think we've also... Have, have the American people with this explosion of scandal mongering, have, have they j become more accepting of it? Uh, those poll results we showed where the majority of people think Clinton did something very wrong on the FBI files and yet say, I'm going to vote for him. Well, let's see how this evolves over the summer and into the fall. Um, you could make the case, and I, I sort of think it, that if the problems uh, from Whitewater, from the files, from other things keep accruing, and we don't know that, uh, then there will, I think, there will be an erosion of his standing. Uh, look, the election's being fought over the undecideds. An awful lot of people have decided long since that Clinton is flawed, but I prefer his ideas about government. I prefer the direction he wants to go. Uh, others have made up their mind. They can't stand him and nothing can talk them into it. But I think we're in a fluid situation. Might there come a point, if there is too much that comes out that is credible, where this group that's going to decide the election throws up their hands? I don't think we can sit here today and, and say. Just, just tactically. Uh, from the Republican point of view, the more they can drive this scandal, the more it keeps Clinton on the defensive and off message. But they have to be careful. If it mm -hmm. looks like they're exploiting it, right? Uh, it can backfire. They have a very good, I, I'm sort of surprised that they are not concentrating, or, or the, the appearance that they are not concentrating on, I'm a conservative, he's a liberal, here's what conservatives well, believe, here's what liberals believe, because that's the natural advan advantageous well, terrain for the Republicans. That's well, how the wait, obvious way to run a campaign right now. Wait for the fall. I think you're going to see a lot, a lot more of that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean what I said before, and I said they have to be careful. That doesn't mean that important Republicans aren't egging on certain committee chairmen, that they're not floating around a lot of information around town. Uh, if you want to hear some good rumors, call a Republican. They've got mm -hmm. you know some very interesting ones. but. Uh, they're sort of, you know, affecting the atmosphere. So, Susie, that you wrote a book about this. Did the Democrats do the same thing when there was a Republican president? Oh, sure. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the post-Watergate rise in the incidence of scandal uh, was partly a matter of Democrats getting a real kick out of being able to beat up 
uh, on the Republicans when Ronald Reagan took over in the executive branch, and there is an element of payback now. It, 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 it's, so, so this is, are we agree that this is a, a bipartisan phenomenon, depending on who's in and who's out, who's ox is gored, anybody will take advantage no. of these new conditions? No, because then you'd have to say there is a whitewater equivalent every, you know, in every administration, or there's a Watergate equivalent. I, I don't think you can do that. But Although I, certainly both parties do obviously take advantage sure. when they're in the majority, and, and that's happening now. But it's also true if you, if you trace back with the exception of, of uh, Watergate, which was the super scandal of all time, at least for this century, even greater than Teapot Dome, with the exception of Watergate, scandal really has determined very, very few elections. And if Bob Dole wins, it isn't going to be a, because of scandal. Look, I, I, I want to come, come back to that, but why was Watergate such a uh, monumental scandal when, in point of fact, what drove Watergate was uh, perjury? Uh, obstruction of justice, just the same things that uh, people are alleging about uh, Whitewater and uh, Travelgate and Filegate and all this kind of oh, stuff. Ben, I don't want to get into a debate over it. There's not much time. If Whitewater turns up certain kinds of actions once the Clintons, and I say the Clintons, were in the presidency, so far that's not the case. It, it might be. You had a criminal conspiracy being run out of the Oval Office. You had serious obstruction of justice. You had, as I said, it was a challenge to the Constitution. Uh, the underlying offenses in Watergate are not as significant, I, I'm sorry, in Whitewater, are not as significant as those in Watergate. If, however, you find out that there has been an abuse of the FBI uh, to taint uh, the reputation, indeed, to indict, uh, a, a, an employee of the FBI for political purposes, an employee of the White House for political purposes, uh, if you discover that something really terrible has gone on with the FBI files, then you are talking about the same classes of offense. That's still an if. It's interesting how distorted things have become. We can't distinguish in some ways between Watergate and Travelgate and Whitewatergate because there's this constant bleeding from the media that everything's a scandal, everything's sensational. And there's the other very unfortunate phenomenon of the criminalization of political difference. Politicians lie. Politicians occasionally obstruct the correct uh, processes of government. That shouldn't mean that they should therefore be hauled in front of congressional committees, hauled in front of a special prosecutor, given six-figure legal bills. Um, many of these differences should be fought out in the political arena, but not in the criminal arena. And I think in the last 20 years there's been this unfortunate mixing of the two, which makes everything equivalent, and it shouldn't be. I absolutely agree with you. L Gil, uh, let me ask you a question. You were writing a book ab about presidential couples, uh, presidents and uh, first ladies. Uh, is, is what's happening to Hillary Clinton, is that fair game? Nancy Reagan would think so. Um, many of the first ladies have often been punching bags for America. Um, all kinds of anxieties about women, all kinds of anxiety about unelected people seizing power close to the presidency have come out and, and, and have led many of the first ladies to be pilloried. Um, and Hillary Clinton has repeatedly said that. She kind of takes some solace in the fact that other first ladies have been equally beaten up. And sometimes I think she uses it as a way of excusing some of her own morally questionable actions. And, you know, you have to remember, even taking into account the Eleanor Roosevelt example, there never has been a co-presidency until now. I mean, they've advertised it as such, and I think in many respects uh, well, there they, is a co-presidency. They've not really advertised it as a oh, co-presidency. They, they trumped for the price of wine, absolutely, they, in 1992. In 1993, I think there was a co-presidency. But let's talk about the six months from now when my book comes out. Uh, is it fair for people, to, I'm sure the Republicans are going to come to this, they're going to say, look, if you elect Clinton, whether we like it or not, you're going to go through two or three years of big public hearings about the president, about the first lady, mm -hmm. about Whitewater, about Paula Jones, about everything. Do you really want to live through that? Therefore, vote for the other guy. Is that legit? Of course. That's it perfectly is. legitimate. I mean, you can see the storm clouds gathering. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the public will take that into account. They'll weigh the alternatives. And we'll see what they decide in November. Bill uh, Clinton campaigned with his wife. Uh, at a certain point, right before the 1992 convention, he made sure to be photographed on the cover of People magazine with his wife and a daughter in a group hug to show that he was a family man. I can think of no American politician who hasn't posed 
with the family at one point or another who hasn't in some ways brought character into play. I think they all do it, and I think it's because we, we want to use that as a way of sifting through all these claims and as a way of understanding is right. this a man or woman we trust. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth Drew, Larry Sabato, Suzanne Garment, and Gil Troy. And thank you. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.